One of the reasons I like to do this show is that I feel I always learn something new from the guests I interview. Well, now I get to learn something new about one of my guests as well. I've interviewed Vince and Jenna several times before. As a world-renowned psychic medium and spiritual teacher, Vincent has told us so much about how to communicate with our departed loved ones and how to understand the superstitions we like to tell ourselves. But Vincent's real mission is as a healer, using his skills to uncover truths about his clients that up to then have been too painful for them to see for themselves, and then show them how to clear those blocks so that they can fulfill their purposes and live lives they love. Well, now Vincent put all of his insights and teachings into a book called The Secret That's Holding You Back. And I can't wait to talk to him about it. So welcome back to the Dream Power Show, Vincent. Oh my gosh, Debbie, thank you for having me here. It's always wonderful. And you've got such an incredible rainbow over you. I can't tell if that's a screen or if that's coming from you. Oh, that's that's very flattering. It, it is it's what I call my dreamy background. Anyway, Vincent, we all know you as a psychic medium, and you begin the book with the story of how you became aware of your psychic abilities. And, and it brought to mind this question I have was, can we all be psychics? Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, Debbie, we are, okay? But most people don't even know it. Another word for psychic, which is more acceptable, especially in the scientific world, is intuition. Mm -hmm. wow. Intuition and psychic ability are exactly the same thing. We're connected to the same place. Carl Jung, who was Sigmund Freud's greatest student, said that we are connected to the collective unconscious mind or the mind of God. That's where intuition lies. I say that you're connected to your soul's mind, which is within your psyche, and that's where your intuition is and your connection is. Now, the difference between me and other psychics and the mainstream public is I was presented with this knowledge that I was going to be the spiritual teacher and I was going to have the psychic ability. So I focused and honed in on that ability and did everything I can to develop it and improve it. So everybody has the capacity to be their own psychic, but it does take some work. It does take some honoring your inner voice because that's where the intuition comes in. I just spoke with somebody today and they turned around and they said, oh, sometimes I listen to my voice and, and I make mistakes. And I'm like, uh, 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 uh. you got two voices going on. You've got your human thinking voice that chatters away all day long, right? And then you've got your internal soul's mind intuitive voice. That doesn't chatter. That comes through more as a feeling. Then we're supposed to use our logical thinking mind to label the feeling. But if you're over emotional about something, you're never going to hear that intuition. So you got to clear that all out. But yes, absolutely. We're all psychics and can develop it to any level we want, Debbie. Yes. Well, and speaking about that, when, when you first got that awareness that you had that within you, uh, it took a lot of work to really develop it because of all of the blocks that you were holding within you and the same blocks that not same specifically, but we all have blocks that we're holding in us. And one of the things that you write about, which is fascinating and, and I totally believe also, is it is the power that the beliefs have over us and that so many of them come from what we develop as children. Why do they have such a hold on us? Oh, because it's just, it's who we are. It's, it's, there is a phenomena about the human mind and brain that most people don't understand. It's because of the highest functions of the brain. The first highest function of the brain is to keep us alive, Debbie. The second highest function is to protect us in order to keep us alive, okay? So it does that in all different ways. We know how it does it physically. For example, it raises our body temperature when we have a virus or a bug to make it an unlivable environment for that, bu that bug. So the brain also believes that anything that comes in, be it stimulation 
from your environment must be important. And so what it does is it grabs hold of whatever comes in and it harbors it. It puts it in different sections. Of, uh, it compartmentalizes it to make it easy. And in my book, I talk about the original three compartments that Sigmund Freud, again, was the one who identified the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious or superconscious mind. So that's three compartments. But I said that there's two more compartments, and that's in my book. But your brain needs to hold on to that information. So when mom and dad, when you were six, seven, eight years old and you were going to school and you didn't come home with a good grade and they said, well, that's not good. That's not good enough. You need to be do better than that. You know more game playing, you know, until your grades come up. Well, you will hold on to that because the brain feels it's an important aspect about keeping you alive. So... There's so many people today that just say, well, get over it, you know, get over your past, get over that. Stop repeating your story. Even in the new thought movement that talks about, don't repeat your story, create a new one. Well, that's all well and good if we were really capable of doing that, but we'd have to get new brains, Debbie, in order for that to happen. You can take the hard drive of a computer and you can put a whole bunch of information on it. And if you want, you could format that hard drive and remove all of that information. Well, where the brain is similar is you can put a whole bunch of information in that brain. Where it is dissimilar, you cannot ever format your brain. As a matter of fact, because of all of those beliefs that get harbored in and held on to, think about this for a moment, Alzheimer's and dementia. They're said to be diseases. In my research and studies, when I was becoming a psychotherapist, I discovered more that Alzheimer's is a defense mechanism. It's the brain's way of protecting you from emotional pains, especially when you're older. What do we do when we're older? We ruminate. We think about our past. We assess our past, right? The memories. And we may not have great memories of our past, things we didn't do that we, we have regrets, things we did do that we have even more regrets of doing that caused harm or hurt. So what does the brain do? The only thing it can, it shuts off the connection between those memories and your conscious mind. Those memories are still in there because like I said, it can't format it. It doesn't format your long-term memory. It shuts off the connection between your long-term memory and your conscious mind. So now you don't remember that horrible past. So it's the brain's way of protecting us, but there are ways of releasing that information that is causing our hurts and pains and manifesting our lives, Debbie, but we have to gain control of it. That's what's all in my book is how to be able to do that. Well, absolutely. And, and then talking about things uh, that we tell ourselves when we're children, and then we tell the wrong story about it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be some major trauma that happened to you. It could be something very innocent that you would nobody in the, an adult would never think twice about it being an issue or anything. But as a child, you take it the wrong way. You don't realize you're taking it the wrong way, but what happened as a result of that? Well, that's the whole point is with your undeveloped mind as a child. And I'm going to now all the adults and all the parents out there, especially new parents. And my daughter is going to be one of them in a couple of weeks. Well, actually, no, in a couple of months. OK, I'm trying to rush it because I want another grandchild. But for all of you new parents out there, listen to me about this. You give your children way too much credit for understanding. It's one aspect that we don't give them enough credit for intelligence. Da, na, 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 na. Don't go overboard with what their abilities are. Even if you have a servant, believe me, he doesn't even or she doesn't even know what she or he is doing to be that gifted. But the point is they can absorb. They can absorb, but they cannot process until they're old enough. And children only can understand the term love, which is so ambiguous, even for adults, 
by the attention they receive, positive or negative. So you have wonderful cookies and snacks and cakes and candies in your pantry. And at times you give some to your children because you want them to enjoy some of the sweets in life. And now the child wants another cookie or another piece of candy. And you turn around and you say, no, only once. But I want another one. I want, no, stop acting like a brat. I told you, no, you're trying to teach that kid self-control. How many adults do you know in this life have self-control over that and eat and want more than one cookie? What's the difference between you and that child? And as child, that he has the least amount of self-control and you're trying to teach him that. And the reason why they respond the way they respond is because the attention they receive from the positive reinforcement, here is the cookie, says to them, I love you. When you deny the cookie or the candy, it says to them, I don't love you. That's all they know. And that's why they're constantly responding, reacting in negative ways because they're supposed to be feeling love and this turmoil world, world, they're receiving so many different messages that yes, they're going to form all of a sudden, their brain must resolve every conflict in their minds. And because you didn't give them a cookie in their minds, they're thinking I'm not lovable. You, mommy and daddy, don't care about me. And if you don't believe me, see what's happened to some of the adults and a lot of the adults in the world today, the way they're acting, they're acting like children having temper tantrums because their inner child is feeling mommy and daddy don't love me. I'm not lovable. And you'll even hear some of them turn around and say, well, I got to do this for myself because I don't care about you. You don't care about me. I don't care about you. And the only thing that these adults aren't doing is going, Ehh. but it's their inner child that's responding that way because of the lack of attention or the negative attention they received when they were younger, no matter what it was, even from not getting a cookie again. Absolutely. Crazy. I know. And But you say that, though, that as adults, we create other beliefs that are sort of supposed to compensate for all of that, but that just even creates even more problems. It is. It's exactly what's in my book. I call it the adult made mind forms. Once your brain starts to develop more, right? And it recognizes you're walking around with these feelings. I'm not good enough. I'm not deserving. I'm not lovable. Nobody likes me. Oh, that's painful. The protective mechanism kicks in and it starts creating a whole new set of beliefs to shield and block you from those maladaptive, painful ones. So, so instead of now believing I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough. No, that switches all of a sudden. Wait a minute. That person's a dope. Oh, my boss is, is a jerk. That's the reason why I didn't get a promotion. Oh, my partner. Oh, so selfish, thoughtless, and, and abusive. And they'll go on and on with the defense mechanisms that they create now to blame, to project, to deny all of those, to repress, to suppress. But it's doing that to allow you to keep functioning. When I was a psychotherapist, Debbie, we, we learned cognitive behavioral therapy skills, right? Most important is get people functioning productively in society in their life. So they come in with anxiety or depression or whatever the, the mental pathology is. We help to give them coping skills just to get through the day until the next circumstance that happens to come up that may be negative. And then we give them more or other skills or other tools that we use, right? There's so many tools out there that we use. But so much of that is uh, is wonderful as it is, it's also band-aids because coping isn't about thriving. And here's the difference. Yeah, you can get through life. I was a hospice social worker. So I wound up dealing with almost five, actually 500 patients plus 
and help assist them through the dying process while I was supporting their caregivers and loved ones and family members through the same process. And so many of them were very functional in their lives, except at the end, everything fell apart. Everything for them, their belief systems, everything broke down because when you're at your weakest point, you no longer have the strength and the energy to maintain those defenses. And so now what pops to the surface is all those things you harbored and suppressed about yourself. And that's how I knew that people, yes, you were functioning, but you weren't thriving and living. And they had so many regrets. They had so many denigrative beliefs about themselves, our, our, our self-loathing beliefs that they never did anything about. As a matter of fact, that's what led to their diseases to start with. It's all in my book about how that can happen. And so it was the saddest thing waiting until that point. Now all of this stuff surfaces and, and they don't have those beliefs that the adult made mind got them through anymore. They all are only left with their inner core beliefs. Like I said, the ones that cannot be formatted from your mind, but were never faced and dealt with. There is a way to deal with them. So tell me, how do we become the purposeful people we ought to be? And unstoppable? And unstoppable. Well, okay. I'm going to say this. The process is easy. Easy peasy. The practice is difficult. So before I even give those steps, I want to let you and the listeners and the watchers know right now, it will be the hardest work you have ever done. It'll be continuous work you will always do. But it will also be the most rewarding work that you have ever done. You know, I have dealt with people who became CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, Debbie. And when they told me how they got there, that was a piece of cake compared to the work they now had to do to get to where they really wanted to be. I don't know if we set it up that way soulfully. You know, we are obstinate beings. It takes us a long time to learn. I mean, my goodness, we're even hearing stories now that extraterrestrials are coming down and trying to help us because we are taking such a long time to evolve. We've got everybody trying to help us evolve. And so maybe we set it up this way because there is such incredible ecstasy in evolving, in evolving. I remember Esther Hicks giving a talk as Abraham, and it was a question and answer period. And a husband who never wanted to come to the event to begin with he was going to ask a wise ass question. So he raised his hand and he comes forward and his wife is like hiding her face and like totally embarrassed. And Abraham goes and says, okay, sir, what is your question? And he says, all right. So Abraham, you're all wise and knowing, tell me this. If dogs are so intelligent, why do they insist on riding with their heads out the window only to have wind and debris blowing into their eyes? And Abraham looked at him and said, sir, you actually asked the most profound question of the evening. His wife was thoroughly surprised, like a door in headlights. It's like, oh my gosh. And Abraham said, he does it because it's exhilarating. It's exhilarating to deal with the dust and the debris and get through it. We're on a ride here, Debbie. And yes, it's really hard and it's hard work, but it's such worthwhile work because it's exhilarating when you get to the other side. I have been doing this work for the past almost four decades now, and I'm still working on Little Vinny. And everything I do, including this book, it's so exhilarating and, and uh, joyous to have reached this point. So... The first step and the hardest step 
is admitting. And and by the way, I'm making this short. I'm giving you the abridged version when in my book, it really details it step by step. The different, I give all different exercises to do exactly what I'm telling you about. You have to take the time and be strong enough to admit that if your life is not going the way you want, if you are not abundant in love and voc- in rewarding vocation, in health and wellness and good feelings emotionally, physically, if your financial status is paycheck to paycheck and not stable and secure to allow you to live the lifestyle you want, are your relationships not steady and strong and unconditionally loving? If any of that is part of your life, okay? then you have to be able to say, I am stopping myself some way, somehow from getting to that level of manifesting what I want and desire. So that is step one, acknowledging it. The moment you acknowledge any kind of threat, anything that gets in your way, it backs down, okay? We've seen that so many times in actuality. We've seen it in the course of history, be it marches and crusades of Martin Luther King Jr. or or Mahatma Gandhi in India or any of them or Jesus saying, turn your cheek, right? Why did they do that? Why did they stand and face what was threatening them? Because eventually what threatens you will back down. So the moment you say, that I am having a defense that's keeping me from seeing what I really believe about myself. I want to see it. You've immediately disempowered it. But it takes time and strength to be able to do that. The next thing you do is going to require more courage than anything else. I just got back from a safari, seven safaris in South Africa with my wife. We thought we'd never do this. A friend said, come, I'm here for the next three months. Come visit me. And both my wife and I said, okay, because it just sounded too wonderful. It was the greatest experience of my life. I felt less threatened by the lions and the elephants that were surrounding our Jeeps. An open Jeep, they could have attacked at any time. I felt less threatened by that than I did when I had to face little Vinny and what was little Vinny really feeling about himself. That's the hardest part because, Debbie, we think those maladaptive beliefs and truths are truths about us. It's actually the reason why people have a difficult time going to therapy. And we learned that in school. You're going to have a hard time getting clients to come to you who need help because their greatest fear is that everything that they have suppressed about themselves, they believe is really true. Those maladies, the I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable. They're afraid to find out that's all true. And it's not. None of it. We are all magnificent. We are all divine. We're all incredible. Just because of the messages we receive from other people and other adults who have issues themselves because they didn't take the time to heal themselves or my book was written by then, right? They didn't. They passed that down to the kids. Now we want to believe what they're feeding us about ourselves. We've got to bring those feelings to the surface, face them, and start reinforcing truths about who we are. You can't just Say sweet things. Yes, affirmations are wonderful and beautiful. Declarations are absolutely incredible. But it's like this. If you have a whiteboard, I want you to imagine this. Take every single negative feeling you've ever had and thought about yourself, about the world, anything. Write it all over the whiteboard. Now take those affirmations, pretty words, pretty cards, and paste them on top of the whiteboard because that's what everybody tells you to say. Say all of those things. Start thinking about this more than anything else. Now you've painted all these pretty pictures on top of that whiteboard. Have you gotten rid of those negative feelings underneath those affirmations? So Not at all. They're still there. So you must face them. You can't just have a new thought without cleaning the whiteboard and replacing the old thought with the new thought. That's what takes practice. 
because you've trained your subconscious mind, however old you are, that many years. For me, it's been 67 years of those negative feelings, those negative beliefs that are now automatic. You have to consciously be aware all the time that takes work. And you've got to constantly reinforce the truth about who you are. But like I said, all those steps are in the book, Debbie. That's how you take care of it. But it takes consistent practice and work, and you will achieve all the dreams you desire. That is, that is so true. And it does take work. But the other good thing about it is that it doesn't matter how old you are, because if right. you are willing to take, do the work and do everything that's involved, you can do it at 20, you could do it at 80, and you still will discover that that's how you become unstoppable. Absolutely. I'm glad that you said that because I get a lot of elderly clients calling me and they tell me, oh, God, what you're saying, I've done so much work. I can't believe I need to do more. And I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand something. At your age, you've chiseled away all the nonsense now in your life, basically. You have little tolerance for playing games. You know what you like and you know what you don't like. That's it. Well, that actually is a passion, a very developed, intense passion. Now you just have to say, all right, I am sick and tired of this going on in my life. I am making this book work. And that years, 60, 70, 80 years that you've accumulated will absolutely empower you to do that work. So you won't have less energy, you'll have more. Wonderful. Well, Vincent, how can people find out more about you and about the book? Well, all you have to do is go to my website at vincentjenna.com. Of course, I have a link on the front page for my book, but better yet, come to and join my group. Get the book. This is what I'm asking now, a gift that everybody can give me. Get the book, read it, share your thoughts with other people. Go write a review about the book, a five-star review at Amazon. Of course, you can get it at amazon.com. Then come and join. I've got a private group set up on Facebook called The Secret That's Holding You Back. Come there, share your successes in doing the work and even some of the stumbling block. That's what everybody is doing. And when people get together and they start, start sharing their experiences and realize that I'm not the only one going through this, I'll be there and you'll be there for each other, but we will help you and I will help you get to where you wanna be. Get the book, go to The Secret That's Holding You Back on Facebook and go to amazon.com or any fine uh, bookseller. It's everywhere and purchase the book and please give me a five-star review because you're pushing that out into the world so that people can get this information and that's how we're going to heal the world, Debbie. That is powerful information and I'm glad you talked about, you know, what community can do because that is also a great way to yes. begin the healing process. Well, Vincent, thank you so much for being on today. Oh my gosh, Debbie, thank you for having me. As always, you're incredible. You're an incredible luminary helping to get the light out into the world. And I so appreciate you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We've been speaking with psychic healer and author, Vincent Jenna. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. If so, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector Weissman saying, sweet dreams, everybody. <laughs>